Frascati, I don't think I've been here before, which is, I don't know why I haven't been. It's a great pleasure anyway. So you see the t title of the talk, which has to do with a tension between the two great physical theories of 20th century physics. Um, and I hope I do something towards resolving this tension. But first of all, I want to point it out. So let me come to the, oh yes, I've got this. Make sure I can master this machine here. Okay, quantum mechanics, well I'm sure you already know, but I thought I would just, uh, it's a slide I usually use for people who, who don't know anything about quantum mechanics. So at the top, we see uh, the particle aspect of quantum mechanics, and there we see the, the wave aspect where you have the two roots interfere with each other, and we have to understand it by the each of the possible things that the photon might do. Here we have a beam splitter or half silver mirror and another one over there and here's just one over there. So the photon here um, sort of shares its existence between those two roots and if we have detectors here and here, it behaves like a particle because one goes or the other goes, not both. Now here you see you have two ordinary mirrors and another beam splitter and the thing is that it only goes one way and not the other way because these two alternative possibilities coexist and somehow cancel each other out if they go upwards. And to understand that, one has to understand this principle of linear superposition where quantum mechanics says that uh, if one thing can happen or another thing can happen, then you have all these alternatives weighted with complex numbers. So here we have the complex plane and the complex number is point in the plane somewhere, and W and Z are the two weightings, and uh, there's the thing called the unitary evolution, or the Schrodinger equation, basically, which tells you that if you have a, an evolution, the evolution of one possibility and the evolution of the other possibility coexist, and they pay no attention to each other, it's linear, they simply add up, the two evolutions take place as though the other one wasn't present, and so that's the unitary evolution, um, and these A's and B's, the complex multipliers, sorry, is this A and B? Yes, I think so. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the A and B independently develop, and the complex multipliers remain constant. But then you see when you make a measurement, and here we've got the two detectors, which is supposed making a measurement. Over here you could say the whole thing after, I can't quite see my pointer here, but it's just after the, uh, the thing is split in two, and then at the rest of it, you can consider the measuring device. Now, you see, the measurement uh, is sort of, well, we have to see what measurement is, but for the moment, the rule is that you then, only at that point, so you look at these complex numbers, and you take the square of the modulus, that's the square of the distance from the origin in this picture here, and the ratio of them gives the ratio of the probabilities of one or the other. Now, the problem is that these two procedures are mutually inconsistent. You have to have the both of them to make quantum mechanics work, but they don't make sense together because you would have to consider that the measuring apparatus itself, since it's made of matter, and all matter is supposed to obey the rules of quantum mechanics, and though it should be obeying the U rule, the, uh, and the thing is that if the apparatus itself is doing that, you don't get one or the other, you would get superpositions and you wouldn't get measurements. So there's this in incompatibility between the two things. And that's really what I want to address. To my mind, it's not a question of interpreting quantum mechanics. That's people in the old days concentrated in making an interpretation. My view is you've got to um, go beyond quantum mechanics and whatever is going on in this R procedure, the reduction of the state or the collapse of the wave function, as it's usually called, uh, where suddenly you have one or the other with probabilities rather than the superposi superposition of one and the other, which is the U process. And how do you make sense of a theory like that? But rather than making sense of a theory like that, I would propose to go beyond the theory in which the reduction process is a somehow a violation of the unitarity process, and we have to understand how that can come about. Okay. Now, I want to say that the resolution of this is Einstein's general relativity. So we have to bring Einstein's theory. Many people consider that 
you know, you've got quantum mechanics, it's an amazing theory, and general relativity, which seems to be a different theory, as I say, the two great theories of 20th century physics, and the trying to do what's called quantized gravity has been a great activity, still is, and that means try to apply the rules of quantum mechanics to gravity. Now, I want to take a different perspective. It's the other way around. That is to say, do the principles of general relativity have an impact on quantum mechanics? And of course, I think that it's going to be both ways. The quantum mechanics will have an impact on general relativity. But the more immediate thing, which is certainly closer to observation and experiment, is the other way around, I maintain. That is to say, how general relativity, the principles, influence quantum mechanics. Now, the principle illustrated here, well, this is our friend Galileo. I don't know whether he ever did drop a big rock and a little rock from the top of the leading tower, but the story, of course, is that. So we believe the story, and here he is dropping the two, and the thing about it is that if you imagine an insect on one of the rocks looking at the other one, then that insect will not feel any gravitational field. The other one seems to have no effect of gravity on it at all. If you have a falling frame, then gravity disappears. That's the idea, at least locally. And this is more familiar to us now with uh, space travelers. That's a bit of a more futuristic 2001 type uh, space station, but never mind about that. The astronaut uh, doesn't feel the Earth's field. The Earth is right there because the astronaut is falling freely. Falling freely means in an orbit. Uh, with, and so it does not feel the gravitational field. So it's this idea, this basic idea, which was the basis of Einstein's general relativity, um, foreseen to some extent by Galileo, as you can see for that, and uh, I, we want to come to that later. I'm, not, I, I'm going to come back to this principle of equivalence, but for the moment, Einstein developed his theory from this, but also needed uh, to he was led to another principle, which is called the principle of general covariance. And that's the one I want to discuss first. I'll come back to this shortly. Now, here you have to imagine the picture at the top is a curved space-time. And I want to consider, an ob I, what I will talk about mainly is something which is stationary. So you have a body which is sitting on the table, say, and it's stationary. That's not moving. I'm not going to worry too much about uh, relativity with respect to the speed of light and all that. Not moving. Uh, how do you say a stationary state in general relativity? Well, you see, in general relativity, you have to think of space-time. So you've got time as one dimension and space the other way. And uh, what do you mean by stationary? Well, there's a thing called a killing vector. And I've got these green lines pointing up. That means a killing vector. That means if you move up the green lines, the space does not change. So stationary state is one in which you have one of these killing vectors represented by those arrows. And if you slide the whole space-time up the arrows, the space-time does not change. So that's what a killing vector is. Um, now, you would have a notion of time, which, uh, of course, you'd increase the time as you move up. But, but the, the idea is that you have a notion of time this picture, it's a because it's what's, well, I should explain that, that um, the key thing is that even though you think you have a notion, let me come to the next slide, it'll make it clearer. Here I have a picture, just as one I had before, a body at the top, and the killing vector is now re re represented underneath, but the point about the killing vector is really represents differentiation with respect to time. So although, um, in this theory, you have, a, you have a notion of time, and the space is the thing that's curved, if you like. The time is not curved in any way, but nevertheless, you see the curvature of space in the operation of d by dt. I have a colleague in Oxford who called this the first fundamental confusion of calculus. When you write d by dt, it has much less to do with t than all the other variables. It's the other variables which are left constant. And so d by dt is really telling you something about all the other variables and not t, not so much about t anyway. OK, now I'm supposing <coughs> that I move this <coughs> body to one side. And I'll do that by going to the next picture. And you see it's just moved slightly. 
okay, I have another killing vector. And how do I relate the times? Well, you see the confusion of calculus is expressed by how you now write your new t in terms of the old t, and it's all the other space coordinates which now come into it. So the thing is that although I have the same time notion, the space notions are different because it's moved a bit. And the problem is now, I'm going to put the, first of all, let's suppose the two lumps are on top of each other, but when I move them, you have two different killing vectors. Now, the two different killing vectors, you can't say they're the same because the space-time is different. And they're sort of painted on the space-time, if you like, but the space-time for one location is different from the space-time with the other location, and so the arrows are not the same because they're in different spaces. So to say that this is a killing vector or this is a stationary state is problematic. What do you mean by stationary state when you've got two different killing vectors? And you can't identify them. And here's where the principle of general covariance, which Einstein was led to, basically says that the coordinates are not important. You've got to talk about uh, the geometry in, more, in a more invariant way. And this means, in effect, that there is no canonical way to identify the blue arrows with the purple arrows. You, they are simply different. So it's a mistake to pretend that you can identify them. And the argument is basically to, uh, well, just to go back for a moment, the argument is to look at the discrepancy in that and uh, come to a conclusion which I'm going to come to in a different way in a moment. Let's not come to that just yet. But I have a, a later argument which I regard as a stronger argument, and that's the one I really want to concentrate on more. So this first argument I had several years ago, and the second argument, which I'll describe now, was more recent, but still several years ago. And this is now more specifically to do with the principle of equivalence. So we have to think of an acceleration as being equivalent to a gravitational field. So if you like, in the top picture, uh, if you were, your frame of reference is falling freely in the gravitational field, the gravitational field disappears. So there is no gravitational field. It's one of the ironies of, one of the huge ironies of physics, I always thought, because the theory of gravity was the thing which really started physics off or dynamics off in a serious way with Newton and Kepler and people like that who formed the equations and Newton's theory of gravity was extremely, uh, well, important in the development of physics. And suddenly Einstein comes along and says, no, it's not, gravity is not a force because you can get rid of it by falling freely. Whereas all the other forces, you can't get rid of it. So although gravity was the sort of prototype of all the forces in physics, suddenly it, the rug gets pulled out of the way and it's not a, a, a force in the same sense. You have to get used to that idea. Okay, let's try and get used to it. Okay, now this is the serious slide here, so let me try and explain this. Suppose we imagine doing an experiment on a tabletop, so I think we could see the tabletop up here, and you're doing a quantum experiment. And in this quantum experiment, you want to consider the Earth's gravitational field. Now, there are two ways you might do it. The first way is to consider that gravity is a force, and that's the Newtonian perspective, and that's the one in green. I think it's the one in green, isn't it? The Newtonian one is where you say, yes, there is a force of gravity, and you do what quantum mechanics, if you know about quantum mechanics, it's you put a term in the Hamiltonian, and that's a standard procedure which takes into account the force. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Now, the other way of doing it, I think that's the purple one, and you imagine you look Einstein's point of view. The Einsteinian way is you just consider your frame of reference to fall freely, and then there is no gravitational field. And you write down all your equations all over again, and you see what's the difference. Well, there's not much difference. The purple one and the green one, there's only a little bit of a difference, this thing called the phase factor. So one is one of these uh, exponential of something with an imaginary number up there, and this means it's what's called a phase factor, and you usually say, well, who cares? The result is the same, whichever approach you use. That's not quite fair, because if you look carefully at this phase factor, you see there is a T cubed up there somewhere. I hope you can see it. My eyesight is not very good, so you, I hope. 
not by pointing in the right spot. There's a T cubed, and that T cubed tells you, actually, if you want to do your quantum mechanics or quantum field theory correctly, that's telling you that the two ways of doing it are with different quantum field theories. There's different vacua. So the, gre the green vacuum and the purple vacuum are different. Now, in quantum field theory, that wouldn't matter. You could say, OK, who cares? Who cares again? Because you say, as long as you stick to one vacuum, you can do your quantum field theory, your quantum mechanics, and who cares? Now, I'm going to change the problem a bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider that you, in your experiment on the table top, it's not just the Earth's field I'm considering, but I have a lump of material. Let's see, we have it here, this brown one. And this lump of material is put into a superposition of two locations. So it's like a Schrodinger's cat. You could do an experiment, maybe you, like in my uh, second, well, the first example, really, you have a photon which is split into two roots. In one root, it moves the, the, the lump material, let's call it a rock, it moves the rock a little bit one way, and the other one, it, it leaves it alone. So your quantum state is a superposition between these two. And now you're in trouble, because you have two different vacua, and you're not allowed, according to the rules of quantum field theory, you're not allowed to make quantum superpositions between a state in one vacuum and a state in another vacuum. So you're stuck. OK, you're stuck if you want to take this absolutely seriously. But I'm not going to give up here. What I'm going to do is cheat a little bit, just a little bit of cheating. And that's to say, OK, I know I'm cheating, but I'm going to take the superposition nevertheless. And what that means, you look carefully at the cheat. And the cheat involves a little term here, which, again, I have to see where my green thing is pointing. Uh, a little in the bottom right-hand corner, we have a little, uh, you find that there is a, a T cubed, which involves the difference between the accelerations, the, the two little g's here are the accelerations due to gravity. And the difference between those two is the coefficient of the T cubed, and then you say, OK, I've cheated a bit. So we take into account the cheat, and you, aver you average or integrate that over the whole of space. And that gives you, rather than saying a cheat, it gives you a bit of an uncertainty in the total value of the energy of the system. And that's what it gives you. So let's say, OK, I've cheated a bit, but we take into account of that that th this cheat gives us an uncertainty in the energy of the whole system. And you do a little bit of calculation, and you find that, let me go to my next picture, which I hope is the appropriate one. Well, let's, let's I think I've got my things not quite in the right order, but let's do it this way, it's, it'll do. Um, this is a space-time way of looking at the cheat. You see, I have one space-time and the other one, where the lump is in one place and where the other lump is in the other place, and the space-times start to be different from each other. Now, how do you estimate this cheat? Well, let me go back for a moment, and let's say what I really do here. I say that this cheat, which you do a little bit of a calculation, and you find that you can reinterpret the cheat, that is to say, the uncertainty in the energy of the system as a whole, in the following way. What it comes out to, and I'm using here, uh, this is all supposed to be weak fields, so I'm using Newtonian theory, really, I'm not using full general relativity. I'm supposing the motions are slow. I'm supposing uh, that, that they, the curvatures are small. And nevertheless, I, I, can, I can still get into this trouble. And the trouble tells me that there is an energy uncertainty which can be calculated as I take this mass distribution, I subtract it from that mass distribution, so it's plus in one place and minus in the other place, and then I work out what's called the gravitational self-energy of that difference. And that is the EG. EG is the measure of the cheat, or the error in the energy as a whole. So this energy uncertainty is EG. And then I say, OK, now I use Heisenberg's time energy uncertainty. And that tells us that it's like, if it's like an unstable nucleus, there is an energy uncertainty which is reciprocally related to a lifetime. So I'm going to use the same argument, but sort of in reverse here. I'm saying that if we have an energy uncertainty, then this state, 
which is the superposition of the two locations, has a lifetime which is explicitly proportional to the reciprocal of that EG, that is the energy uncertainty. So that is the, the formula. It's essentially the same as something that Diyoshi came up across much earlier than I did. Um, but the difference here is that I have a, a justification for general relativity, general relativity principles. So it seems to me that there's a strong case to say that there is a lifetime for that superposition which is reciprocally related, h bar over eg um, is essentially the lifetime. I mean, I'm not saying it's always the same lifetime. It's like an unstable nucleus. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter, but it gives you the measure of the half-life of the system. Now, the picture at the top is supposed to give you a, a, a sort of geometrical feel for what this lifetime is. I'm so sorry, I've gone too far here. Uh, yeah. The, the, uh, you want to measure the difference, you see. The difference is partly a spatial difference and partly a temporal difference. And what I say is when that difference becomes of the order of one Planck unit cubed, well, this is this thing when quantum, if you're considering quantum mechanics and gravity together, then you come up with this thing called the Planck unit, which is very, very tiny as a distance. Uh, but what one says is that when that difference between the space times, which involves a spatial difference as well as a temporal difference, so if the spatial difference is more, then the temporal difference is less. That means the, the, the space time, you see, it makes a choice between, somehow the universe makes a choice between green and brown, and that seems to be probabilistic choice as far as we understand it. Uh, but the when is the lifetime, how long is that? Well, it's when the four volume difference between the green and the brown reaches, roughly speaking, one Planck Four, four volume. So that's a sort of geometrical way of thinking about it. I, I wanted to say something else. It's a different story altogether, and I'm not wanting to, to talk about it here, but it's quite interesting that one of my other interests, well, is, is the question of uh, what, what conscious perception is. And the argument is that it's built out of elements like this, and so that the argument is that the the choice between one and the other is somehow the building block of a conscious perception. So we call that an, an element of proto-consciousness. So whatever consciousness is, it's built out of elements of this nature. I don't want to go into that here because it's a completely different story, but I thought I would just show you that here because it's, it's a, a, another area that I have a, an interest in and the, the reduction of the state. You see, you might even uh, connect it with free will or something like that. Is there a, a free choice in the universe which makes one or the other? And is this intrinsic free choice or is it purely random? Of course, current quantum physics says it's purely random, but maybe there is something deeper underlying the choice which is not random and somehow goes together ultimately to what we refer to as free will. Now, I'm not going to make a big thing about that because I really don't have a clear view on what it is, but the argument is that perhaps that does relate in some way to a, an essential indeterminacy, or perhaps not an indeterminacy, but something <coughs> which has a deeper uh, reason behind which choice is made. But with current quantum mechanics, it seems to be completely random with certain well, probabilities, which, you, um, <coughs> which is another story. I won't go into that here. But uh, that's the idea that maybe it does connect to free choice or something like that in some way. But let's not continue on that story. Let's go back and talk about the EG and think about the simplest case, really, where we now have a uniform sphere. So we have that at the top, the uniform sphere. And I'm putting that into two locations, displacing it from one location to the other. And the EG is simply, as I say before, oops, oh, I keep jumping. What I say before, it's the uh, difference between the mass distribution here and the mass distribution there, and then you work out the gravitational self-energy of that difference. And this is the calculation, and this form graph at the bottom tells you, as you move one away from the other, the EG grows and grows until contact, and then it sort of tapers off. So you get a feeling that if you wanted to measure this thing, 
it's not much advantage taking them a long way away. The major effect is from superposition to contact. So there's hardly much point in moving a long way away. Uh, the main effect, if this is the real answer, th to is that the EG is, uh, it grows up to contact, and then there's not much more after that. So the point is that the state would reduce to one or the other in a time scale which is inverse of, of the, um, what we have here. Okay, so let's continue. Now, another point is that maybe one ought to consider not just a uniform sphere, but the sphere, of course, the, the top here is going to be uniform, but really, there are lots and lots of nuclei, you see. And the problem is that if you consider particles to be point particles, then when you move this a little tiniest little bit, you get an infinite answer for EG. So that can't be the right answer. But what in this scheme, what you do is you consider what a stationary state would be like. And in a stationary state, well, you have to cheat a little bit here. You say stationary, but you, you have to worry about the mass center. You say, let's pretend that the mass center can be fixed. And then you try to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, relative to the mass center. Or else you do something called the Schrodinger-Newton equation, which is a little more sophisticated. But roughly speaking, what you do is you throw away the problem about the mass center, and you then look at the distribution in your stationary state, and it will be spread out something like this. So you don't get these delta functions. You get a spread out, and the argument that would be that you get a finite answer for displacing one lump from the other. So that's, that's the basic principle. And OK, what about experiments? Well, there has been a proposal for a long time. Uh, this is an experiment which is still going on. I can't remember when Dirk uh, Baumeister originally uh, started working on this. It was probably something like two decades ago. Um, I only saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he gave a talk on this. I was afraid that he may have forgotten all about it, and uh, was very pleased to hear that he's making good progress, and he's estimating that within the next two or three years, they should have an answer to this. Uh, let me explain in more detail what we're doing here. Here we have a, a laser, which emits a photon, and here we have a beam splitter, so half over a mirror, and the photon is split in, into two. One half of the photon state goes this way, and you keep it in a cavity, which reflects backwards and forwards, million times or something. And then the other one goes this way, and it is another rather peculiar cavity where I've tried to draw it a bit bigger here. There's a, like a hemispherical mirror. You have to let the photon in, so it's all very clever how you do that. You let it in, and then you make the mirror to become actually a, I mean, when you let it in, it's transparent, and then you suddenly make it non-transparent, and then you have a photon which reflects backwards and forwards on this little, you think of a little diving board there, but the end of it is a, a little cube, which is about 10 microns cube, and I've pretended to draw the nuclei in here, and uh, of course there are many more than, than that in the picture, but it bounces backwards and forwards, the photon hits it something like a million times, and that million times is enough to push it with the pressure of the photon hitting it again and again and again to, to transfer so that the nuclei will be in a superposition of moved and not moved because the photon going this way is in a superposition of coming this way and going the other way. So you get this mass distribution and you can then use the formula about the EG and that should tell you a, a time within which that should reduce and become one or the other. And then you bring the photon back and, and you try to see whether there has been any loss of phase coherence. You see if it reduces in the experiment, I think it's something like a seconds to minutes. I'm not quite sure <clears throat> the details of, uh, of the situation at the moment, but when I was involved in these things, it was something like you, you look for an experiment where the reduction time, according to the formula which I just gave you, that formula should tell you that it becomes one or the other in something like a second or a minute, depending on the details, and you would then keep it going for that length of time, bring the two back again, and see whether there is a phase coherence. Does the photon go back the way it came, or does it go up instead? And that loss of coherence 
uh, could be because it isn't now coherent with the other, it has reduced, it's become one or the other, and then you would see the difference. Of course, it might see the difference because it's a bad experiment. Maybe there's some air got in the molecule of air and hit it, or vibrations going along the, the uh, suspension, or all sorts of things. So it's clearly a very difficult experiment. You've got to get rid of all these other ways that you might somehow lose the coherence. And the only loss of coherence, then, if you've got rid of all those effects, is the reduction of the state from a superposition to one or the other. So it's a, a really nice experiment. When I was in Leiden, I think about eight years ago, I should say Baumeister shares his time between Leiden in the Netherlands and Santa Barbara in the United States because he gets technology expertise in both places. <coughs> and I visited Leiden for <coughs> a month or two about eight years ago. And he, without uh, prompting and, and uh, without uh, just completely spontaneously, he, he said, in 10 years, we'll have an answer. And a little while later, about uh, two years later, I was at a conference, and he said, in seven or eight years, this was two years later, we'll have an answer. So I thought that was pretty consistent. And the last time I saw him, it's two or three years. Well, that's not bad. So I think we may well expect that he will have an answer to this, one way or the other, to see whether the state does, in fact, reduce according to this formula, or does quantum mechanics come through again unscathed, and that you have the superposition of these two things without it reducing into one or the other. I'm hopeful that it will come out in the accordance with what I think I like to believe in. Okay, let's go on from this. Now, where do we go from here? And now you see, I've, the thing I've been telling you before is a, a sort of belief that we have a reduction in the state. Now, what kind of theory could produce that? It's, it's a completely, I mean, there are lots of theories, and you've heard about them at the conference here, those of you who have been at the conference. And there are many ideas, very ingenious ideas, uh, about how the state might reduce. Now, um, I always find it very peculiar, the reduction of the state, that somehow nature goes along and suddenly, punk, it does one or the other thing, which seems a very peculiar idea. You can have a thing where it does it gradually or something like that. but. Uh, it seems to me that you want a theory in which a choice between one alternative or, or another is forced upon you. And I want to describe a scheme in which that might be the case. I want to, is it, this scheme is, is what's called twister theory. I've been working on that for goodness me, how many years I can't remember now. So, a good many, um, at least half a decade, half a century. And what's the basic idea behind twister theory? Well, it's a, an idea where you're trying to, I should say this is very relativistic now. Everything up to this point has been taking the speed of light essentially to be infinite, whereas now this is very crucially, we're talking about the speed of light being part of it. And I want to consider two different roles for the Riemann sphere. Now, the Riemann sphere, that is the complex numbers together with a point at infinity, and I want to describe two roles of this. I should say that the point about the Riemann sphere is that it's a conformal sphere. So we have, first of all, the relativity role. What I'm imagining is that we look out in space, you look at the sky, and, well, here I've got a picture here, this is the light cone, and I have two observers whizzing past each other at the point here, and at that point they look out at the same sky, and what do they see? Well, because they're moving so fast with respect to each other, there's an aberration effect, and the sky looks a bit different, but the difference between one and the other is a conformal map. So this is to tell you that any, if you saw a circular pattern of stars in the sky, then the other observer would also see a circular pattern of stars in the sky. The, the Riemann sphere, going to the Riemann sphere, is a complex analytic transformation which preserves circles. So it's a conformal transformation that preserves circles. So I was very intrigued by this when I first realized this. So that's a relativity role for the Riemann sphere. Now, the other side of twister theory is quantum mechanics. And we have, again, a fundamental role for the Riemann sphere and directions in space. The other one was also to do with the directions. That was more space-time directions, but now directions in space. Suppose we have a spin-half particle, and you can consider the two basic states, spin up and spin down, right-handed 
up, right-handed and down, if you like. And then all the different directions of spin are combinations of those. And it's the ratios of these two amplitudes, the W and the Z. And we again see the Riemann sphere, now explicitly in terms of complex numbers. But it's the same Riemann sphere. It's to do with the directions in space being described in this complex way. And it's a very nice thing that I've, I was always found it very appealing that somehow it's specifically related to the three dimensions of space and one of time. So when I heard about theories in which you had, got goodness knows, 11 dimensions of space, or 26 or whatever it was, I didn't like them. I like a theory which has the right number of space dimensions and one, number, one time dimension because you get that two rows of the Riemann sphere coming together and the idea is can you bring relativity and quantum mechanics together sort of via this kind of idea. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to rattle through this a lot. There's another role for the Riemann sphere also, which is important in quantum field theory. The top one is what you do. You see, an important role for quantum field theory, it was Engelbert Schucking when I shared an office with him in, in Syracuse many, many years ago, and he emphasized to me, at a time when people weren't stressing this so much, that an important aspect of quantum field theory is the splitting of amplitudes into positive and negative frequencies, or positive and negative energies. And this is, I should say, the thing which gets messed up in the T cubed thing I had in the exponential. So that's where, where you really have a problem with changing your vacuum. So this thing about splitting things into positive and negative frequencies is a very fundamental thing to quantum field theory. And I kept feeling for a long time that I wanted to see this in a more global way, something which is not specifically thinking in terms of Fourier components and so on, which is the way people usually do it, but the idea that you have your real, the, the equator of the sphere, you think of as the real numbers together with infinity, and you have functions on that, and if they extend one hemisphere, they're positive frequency, and the other hemisphere, they're negative frequency. So you have this nice idea of the real thing is there, and somehow there's a world, a complex world, hiding behind it, and it's that which is driving the, the physics. So the picture here, this is what you get in Twister theory. The, the equator is, if you, if you like, it's the space of light rays. If I go back to my previous picture here, if you think of, well, it's the picture on the, on the right. If I can remember which button I press on this thing. Yes, here we are. See, that is Twister space. Well, it's not quite the whole of Twister space. This is the real part. See, if I take the light rays, each light ray is a point in this space. And then I say, what is a point in this space? Well, I think of all the light rays to this point. So it's the Riemann sphere. So the points in the space of light rays are these Riemann spheres. And so that is the geometry here. But this, you see, if you count dimensionality, you find that the light rays form a five-dimensional space. And so this is not a complex space. So you want one more dimension. And the one more dimension is the one you get in this picture Oops, at the, at the bottom here. This, the equator of this bottom picture, the thing going across there, that's the space of the light rays. And when you add an extra dimension to go to the top, that gives you a complex space, and that is the right-handed ones, if you like, or the positive frequency ones, if the picture gets a little confused, and I won't try to explain that here. Um, and the left-handed ones go downwards. So you have this splitting into the two halves, which is again related to the positive-negative splitting. And it took a long time to realize that it really does do that. So in Twister theory, the idea is that you have this equatorial region, which is the space of light rays, including some at infinity, and then you fill it out with an extra dimension, and this now gives you a complex space. So the complex numbers, complex analyticity, analyticity play a big role here. And that was always, a, for me, a great thing. Now, here's some equations. I don't want to go into details here. I just wanted to say that this is the way you do Twister theory. You have the omega and the pi. These are both two component spinners, two complex numbers each. The Twister itself has four components. Um, you're looking at projective twisters often, so that gives you um, three components, so it's a projective space. And then that gives you three, that's six in the complex, and that was the space I just had in the thing here. Six-dimensional space, that is the space of projective twisters, or twister up to proportionality. 
And then the condition here, zz bar equals zero, that's for the light rays. So you get a light ray if it has zero norm, that's the idea. And then you tell, this tells you what happens when you move the origin. And then what is the physical interpretation of them? Well, you see it's directly here. You have a momentum and an angular momentum. And you can construct the momentum and the angular momentum out of the twister components. And this is the physical interpretation of the twister. The momentum is the pi. The letter was pi because it gives you a, a p. You see the momentum is usually represented by p. And so the pi times its complex conjugate pi, pi bar is the momentum. It's a null momentum, so it points along the light cone. And the omega, a letter commonly used for angular momentum, fills out the momentum to give you this relation for the angular momentum. So that is how you, uh, the round brackets mean symmetrization, if you want to look at the formula in detail. OK, that's for massless. You can also treat massive particles. I won't go into this, but the basic way is you just sort of um, think of a zigzag of massless ones, and then you've got a freedom in how. And maybe it's related to uh, leptons and baryons and things like that. We had a, a go at thinking about that. I think it needs to be thought of again. This was an idea which needs to be thought through all over again for the basis of things that come up later. Now, this is one of the important uh, ways in which twister theory did something a little bit magic. Um, these are written in two component spinner form, so you probably won't recognize them unless you're familiar with two spinners, um, for the different wave equations for different spins. So at the top, we have the scalar wave equation, which is just Laplacian. And then, the, then we have the right-handed and left-handed. If you have two indices, that gives you the light, left and right-handed version of the Maxwell equations. One index, they would be massless neutrinos. If you have four indices, that would be linearized gravity, right-handed and left-handed. The, the, which I forget which is which now. The right-handed ones at the top, I think, and the left-handed at the bottom. Now, there is a thing at the bottom, which I'm giving you various homogeneities for these different things. And I have to explain where that, what that's to do with. And that's to do with this rather amazing formula that you find if you want to solve those equations, which I've written down again up here. You have a nice contour integral. You take a twister function. The f is a function of a twister, which is homogeneous of the degrees mentioned in this thing at the bottom, which I'll say a little bit more in, about in a minute. Um, and these things give you the, uh, the an arbitrary function of that homogeneous degree automatically gives you solutions of these equations here by means of these formulae here. Now, there's a funny thing about these formulae, which I didn't realize for a long time, is that what they're really doing, and this is a bit of sophisticated mathematics. It took me a long time to appreciate this, and Michael Atia, a mathematician colleague of mine, or I knew right from graduate days, uh, explained this idea, which I should have learned when I was a graduate student and I didn't properly learn it, this idea of cohomology. So what you have to understand is that these formulae here are really, well, it's just, that picture is to show you what cohomology is in a simple way, because you might not know what cohomology is. And uh, I was once, and for some reason, I was being interviewed by people for a television program, and they were all about twisters, and they said, well, what are twisters good for? I said, well, you can use it to solve the Maxwell equations, and that's this formula here. And, uh, and they said, oh, that's interesting. And, uh, what's the, and I said, well, it involves an idea that I couldn't possibly explain. What's that? I said, cohomology. Oh, no, no, no. I couldn't explain that. No, no, I'd like to hear about that, they said. So I went home. And then I thought, when I was lying in bed, I thought, yeah, I can explain cohomology. That's it. Of course, they never used it. But th this is my explanation of cohomology. See, these twister functions are really telling you um, you have to think of this space. And this is the picture I have before. You see all those little patches. The function is really telling you how to glue the patches together. So the, each one of these formulae, the integral formula, so the integral is really a contour integral within each of the patches. I won't go into the geometry of it, but it works very nicely. And the, the function is telling you how you join each patch to the next patch. Now, you can have lots and lots of patches as here, but the easiest is when you've only got one patch, or you've got two patches and one intersection region. 
And that's basically all we need to have for what I want to say. So you could imagine cutting this picture here in two. Let's slice it down like that, you see. And then your twister function would tell you how to glue the two pieces here. Now, each piece would make sense on its own. The twister function is telling you how to join them up together. And it's telling you it means something if it's non-trivial. You see, if it's trivial, then you can make it. But this picture here is showing you what a non-trivial one is like. So you have to imagine it's not a piece of three-dimensional geometry, but you're talking about holomorphic functions, complex functions. And the complex function is telling you how to glue the thing together in a way which is impossible. And the impossibility, or the measure of impossibility, is the cohomology element. So although that's a little bit of a long, <laughs> you have to understand these things in detail, really, to get the point of it. But I think it's worth explaining the ideas in this rather simplistic way, because that is the essence of it. And you see, actually, there is an element of this already. OK, when you, you've got EPR things and you've got non-locality, See, one of the ideas is basically that non-locality is playing a big role in physics. And we know for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, and Bell theorem violation, and all sorts of things, that you have got with several particles, two or more, you have entanglements which you can't explain in terms of, well, simply local things. There's got to be a non-local feature. But you see, there's the even more elementary local thing, which Einstein worried about. Here we have a, a wave function. Oh, Let's go back. Here we have a wave function, say a, a source of photon, and this photon goes up, and here's a screen, say quite a long way away, perhaps. And we have detections on the screen, maybe a little spot. It makes a black spot where the photon reaches it. And suppose it makes a black spot here, and as soon as it made it there, this thing sort of, you can think of sending it a message to everywhere else on the screen. Too late, I've seen it. You're too late. You can't see it either. But that message goes faster than light. So how does this green one down here know not to receive the photon without having a signal which travels faster than light? Well, you see, as I say, Einstein worried about this. It's not so clear-cut a non-locality that you get with the violation of Bell inequalities, but it's already something non-local. And the idea is that a single particle wave function, which we're talking about here, is already a non-local thing. And the twister function is certainly non-local. You have to integrate to get the field. But in the twister space, it's very much a non-local thing. So the idea is that the, that non-locality, which is sort of illustrated with, by this picture, is, uh, is more, well, it's, when you have more than one particle, it's a more subtle thing, which you get with the violation of Bell inequalities. OK, now I, I'm not going to go into all this here, but when I thought of See, the bottom picture is showing you something a bit more sophisticated, because everything I've done up to this point was what was flat space twister theory. But it, remarkably, you can make curved spaces, too, by thinking of these patching together. It's not an, a sort of passive function sitting on the overlap. It's actually determining a vector field, which tells you how you slide one patch relative to the other. And with the appropriate homogeneity degree, which happens to be plus 2, you can give a, get a vector field out of it. And that plus 2 corresponded to left-handed graviton. So that was the idea, left-handed graviton. And it means you can actually get a curved twister space, which represents a curved space-time in a way which I'll explore in a minute. The top thing is Richard Ward's construction. He was a graduate student of mine, and very soon after producing that uh, uh, picture here at the bottom, roughly speaking. He produced the way of doing the Yang-Mills equations, uh, and it's a very similar picture. I won't go talk about that more here. It's really the bottom picture I'll talk about, because I'm talking about curved space times. OK, well, now the top thing is going back to flat twister space. Now, we have here the space time, and no. That's right, and this is the twister space on the right-hand side. Now, a point in space-time was a Riemann sphere in, in the twister space. Now, you see, a Riemann sphere, you have to think it's really a projective line. So I can't draw it as a sphere and a line at the same time. Well, sometimes I can. I think of a long sausage or something. 
But the lines here, you think of those as really Riemann spheres. And those represent the points in the space-time. Now, when they intersect, it means that the points are null separated. They lie on the same light ray. So this is the straightforward construction which I gave you before. Now, what I want to do is to make a curved space out of it. So what I do is look locally, first of all. So rather than looking at the whole space, I look at the neighborhood of lines. So here I've got a line here, a neighborhood of Riemann sphere, if you like, and I thicken it out into the twister space. That's all I'm concerned with for the moment. And then in the space time, well, let, let's take that. And then what I want to do is see what the twister function does. Well, I split it in two with an overlap. And what do I do on the overlap? I shift one space time relative to one twister space relative to the other, and then I get a curved twister space. And then my lines have gone all disappeared because they're, they're two pieces and they don't join. Now you appeal to a nice theorem due to Kodara, and he tells us if you don't move it too much, you can be sure you still find these holomorphic curves, these Riemann spheres, which join up, and what's more, that the space of them is four-dimensional, and so you can construct a curved space-time by this construction, which does give you curved space-times. I'll come to a little snag in a moment, which is actually a huge snag, but before coming to the snag, okay. Was that five minutes or ten? Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's better. Um, there is something about how you get the Einstein equations, which is you project it down. Well, actually, you can do a bit better than that. My thumb gets all um, stiff. Yes, to do that, you have to preserve a thing called the infinity twister. Now, the infinity twister, you see, everything up to this point is pretty conformal. You don't have a notion of distance. You have notions of angles, but you don't know distances. To get distances, you have to introduce this thing called the infinity twister, which is the I. Now, I used to have it without a cosmological constant, but now you see lambda is sitting in the corner, and I learnt my lesson that you need a cosmological constant, otherwise lots of things don't work. It took me a long time to realize that. I had all sorts of things which didn't work, and I thought only needed with zero cosmological constant, but I realize now you need it in, in this theory. So. A lot of people puzzle about where it came from, but in twister theory, you've just got to have it. It took me a long time to realize that. Okay, so we put that in, and then when you go back to the construction, um, no, I think I'm, I want to refer to the, the thing in the bottom corner, which way we have the projection. Now, if you want to get the lambda term in it, the cosmological constant, well, Richard Ward uh, showed how to do that in detail, and you, this means you preserve the infinity twister, and that works when you have a cosmological constant. Okay, so this is a beautiful construction. The only trouble is, see, everything I've said here is complex, and everything I have to now come clean, it doesn't give you a general Einstein solution. It doesn't give you a general space-time. It does give you a general solution of the Einstein equations, with or without cosmological constant, if you're looking only at the left-handed part. It's complex. And being complex, you could split out the real, the right-handed and left-handed parts. And what's called anti-self-dual, those are the left-handed ones. So I used to call this a solution for the nonlinear graviton. It's a graviton which is left-handed and incorporates the nonlinearities of Einstein's equations. But it's only left-handed. And so the problem I have is what we call the googly problem. Uh, if you happen to know, belong to the old British Empire, you know what a googly is, but most of you probably don't. It's a ball which is cricket, is bowled, which spins right-handed, even though your action is left-handed. So the problem is, it's called the googly problem, how do you, using the framework which gives you left-handed, how do you produce the right-handed helicity? So this was a stumbling block for about 40 years in twister theory. How do you get the right-handed uh, gravitons? Without going all, you, you could change the formalism, do the other way around, but then you lose the, the other one. So that doesn't help. You want to do both at once. So you want to have the googly, that is uh, the, the right-handed graviton in the left-handed framework. And only relatively recently, well, starting about five years ago, did I think I realize what you actually have to do. And what you have to do 
is not patch the space times together. So I'm trying to think of how do you patch together. The problem is the points. If you're trying to make a, a twister space, by, it's got curvature by gluing pieces together, but you've still got the points. And the points, the interpretation of them, are things called alpha planes, and that's what makes it anti-self-dual. You're stuck. So the idea is how do you patch these things together without having points? So somehow, you know the algebras, and you don't have the points. Well, again, it was Michael Atia who came to the rescue for me, because the, the problem was, if you know your algebra of functions, which was the idea, maybe you, you don't think of the points, you just know the algebras of the functions on those spaces. But the trouble was, the algebra gives you the points back again, so you're stuck. And what he said, Michael Atia said to me, oh, that's not true if you have a non-commutative algebra. Now, you see, I didn't think stress this particularly, but way back somewhere, we, I'm not sure if I even wrote it down, maybe I didn't. You have a commutation rule between the twisters and the complex conjugates. It's, it's basically the uh, <coughs> Heisenberg of uh, quantization, if you like, of twister theory. It's at the top here. You, ha you, interpret the, uh, the, you interpret the complex conjugate of the twister as d by d, the twister. So here we have your z's are the twisters. The complex conjugate sets bars. Now the first quantization ma makes them into d by d, the twister. So now you have a non-commutative algebra, and you get rid of the bars, so it's a holomorphic algebra. That's always all very nice. You've got complex analytic things, but they're not commutative. And now you patch your spaces together in this way. And using that, there's, it, it really does seem, with the cosmological constant, you need that, but you get the Einstein equations, and you, there's all sorts of procedures using generating functions and how to do this. I certainly can't go into this here. It uh, needs more working to see how it works, but it does seem as though you can encode the general solution of the Einstein equations in this way with lambda. Now, um, the problem with this is, uh, well, what are the points? See, the points are very non-local objects. It was already non-local in the previous construction. So let me go back here to the construction here. Well, you see, the points were non-local things. So the idea I was, if you, if you remember, I think I mentioned the Kodara theorem, which tells you if you, if you, if you make a fairly small displacement, you move them just a little bit, the theorem tells you you still get these lines. But suppose you move them too far apart. Then suddenly, you may not have these lines. Or you may, if you find, have two families in one. So the sort of idea I have, now this is not worked out, but the idea is you do this now all with the, the algebras rather than the functions. You have to go through all that stuff. And then you say, well, where are the points? Well, if you move it too much, so the idea is if you, and you can express, say, linear combinations of spaces too, so you can describe the lump in one place together with the lump in the other place, and it works for a bit, but if you go too far away, then suddenly you find something happens and you lose one of these families or something like that. So although it's very vague, it has this aspect of jumping. That is, you say, things will suddenly jump if the displacement is too much, you may find a new family comes in, or you lose the old one, or something like that. And it seems to me that's much more like something like the jumping you get, apparently, in quantum mechanics. Even though the thing is quite smooth, you, you're moving your twisted space more and more and more, but suddenly the interpretation in space-time undergoes a jump. So although this is still very vague, it's what I sort of think could well be what's happening when you try to this is what we call palatial twister theory, how you try to make that work. Now, do I have any more minutes, or what's the situation? Five. Oh, okay. I just wanted to change the subject. <laughs> At another place, well, you see, it's all to do with quantum gravity. Or is it? You see, here I have a picture of, on the left-hand side, the evolution of the universe, starting with a Big Bang here, expanding out very rapidly, and then slows down a bit, and then we have this exponential expansion, which seems to be taking place because of the presence of 
cosmological constant or something like that, the lambda which I now think is absolutely necessary for twisted theory. Now, what do I do here? You see, twisted theory is all very much to do with conformal stuff. Until you bring your infinity twister in, uh, everything is conformal and you don't have and you don't have distances, you have angles. And conformal geometry is very nice when you don't have any mass. You see, we have the uh, two most famous equations of 20th century physics, Einstein's E equals mc squared and Max Planck's E equals h nu, where um, in the one case you've got speed of light telling you that energy and mass are equivalent, and the other one, you have Planck's constant telling you that energy and frequency are equivalent. Put the two together, and this tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent, which is one of the basic reasons why we have such wonderfully accurate clocks. Because as long as you've got a massive particle which has got a definite mass and is stable massive particle, it is a clock. And that gives you the metric for Einstein's theory very, very precisely. Now, suppose you don't have any mass. So the two places that you don't have any mass, one is in a very remote future, where it's almost entirely photons running around, and so you could say, well, at least for a very good approximation, you've got no mass, and if you've got no mass, then you don't have clocks. You have the light cones, you have conformal geometry, but you don't have clocks. And if you have conformal geometry, then you can squash down infinity, and there are nice theorems to the Hellman Friedrich, which tells you that you can do this quite ge generally. So what I'm doing is a conformal scaling, squashing down infinity to having a quite finite boundary. Now what about the other end? The story is the opposite, but in some ways the same. Because now you have a lot of mass, but you have much more energy. So particles are running around at huge speeds, and so the mass becomes completely irrelevant. So again, you have a regime in which basically you have massless physics. So then it makes sense to apply this trick the other way around, stretch it out, and this was basically Paul Todd, a student of mine, suggestion of how you characterize the very special nature of the Big Bang in which the gravitational degrees of freedom seem to have been wiped out for some reason, and it tells you that you have this picture of stretching out the Big Bang and squashing down infinity so that our picture has a nice conformal initial boundary and a conformal fin final boundary. Okay, the crazy idea is that this is part of a continuing, I call these eons. Our eon is the one in the middle there, and then we, there will be one beyond us, and there was one before us. And because the physics at both ends is essentially conformal physics, you can join this onto another one, and the idea is these continue indefinitely. And this gives you a good reason for the very, very special nature of the Big Bang and the, the way that the second law of thermodynamics works and all this sort of thing. So I've been playing around with this model for, I don't know, 15 years or so. And more recently, it has seemed that there is observational support for this. And the two ways that we've been looking at this, the first one is, on the left-hand side, we see um, black holes coming together and uh, running into each other and uh, huge, uh, supermassive black holes. So these are whopping great explosions. The Andromeda galaxy will eventually collide with ours and the black hole in it will collide with ours eventually. And it's a much bigger one than ours is, so there will be some great emission of gravitational waves in the so many thousands of million years from now, so we don't have to worry about it. But nevertheless, the picture here on the left-hand side is events of that sort could produce signals that we could see in our eon, adventures of that in the previous eon we would be able to see. And two groups, a group, uh, myself and Vahe Gurzijan, and another group, a Polish group with Krzysztof Meisner and Paweł Nirowski, and couple of other people doing the analysis um, seem to see these signals too. But more recently, there's another phenomenon, which, see, well, I'm talking about quantum gravity. You see, this is, where is a place where quantum gravity, or quantum mechanics and gravity play an important role? Well, in Hawking evaporation. So if you have a black hole, according to Stephen Hawking, and I certainly agree with this, the black hole will eventually, 
when the universe gets colder than the black hole, it takes an awful long time, especially with the supermassive ones, it will start to radiate away, it will be the hottest thing around, and the entire mass of that black hole will be evaporated away in radiation. It will take something like a Google years, that's 10 to the 100 years. Well, I gather now that there are even bigger black holes running around, so you have to think maybe 10 to the 1,000 years, I'm not sure, an incredible length of time. But in the pictures that I've been showing you, that is simply way, way tucked into the little incline between one eon and the next. E even worse than that, if you go back into the Planck scale, <coughs> um, whatever it is, 10 to the minus 43 seconds or something, right into the beginning, the black holes will still be around on the other side and so that everything that comes out of that black hole will be squashed into that tiny point. So according to this picture, you will have explosions at the junction between one eon and the next, which will be point-like, but the entire mass of that black hole will be converted into energy. It spreads out to about four degrees in the sky. The, second, the lower of these two planes represents crossover between one eon and the next, and the upper plane is the last scattering surface, and the spread of one point into the next is about four degrees. And it's about more than ten times more the intensity, sorry, I should say what the observations tell us. This is in a paper which is on the, it's not published as yet, it's on the, on the web by Christoph Meisner, Pavel Nirovsky, Daniel, Ann, and myself, in which we analyze the uh, microwave background. And the claim is, well, what I'm going to claim now, is that if you could see the sky with microwave eyes, suppose you could look at them, you could actually see the microwave radiation, you would see these spots. They are, as I say, more than an order of magnitude more than the general variations in temperature. And you would see them. And they would be about um, eight times the diameter of the moon. Now, what's so important about that size? That's what you see is that size. And I should say the confidence level of these signals, I, I would say that they looked at this, the, these other phenomena first. And this is my colleague Christoph Meisner and company. And they assigned a probability value that this is a, a real effect of, uh, of about 99.4% confidence. This one, the level is something like 99.98% confidence. The signals are so strong that, that when you compare them with the random simulations, that's the kind of confidence that they're really there. And the, these, these events, well, the point which is puzzling for standard cosmology, you see, standard cosmology says that you, you're supposed to have inflation. Now, inflation, would spread out the, bi the Big Bang to the next, to the last, uh, to the uh, graceful exit moment by much, much more than five degrees. So any point, any explosion which occurred before the turn off of inflation, which was the graceful exit moment, if you like, think of the word graceful and imagine this huge explosion which we seem to be taking place there and the effect of them seems to be there. I don't know how inflation explains this. I would be very keen to see. Um, in CCC, that's conformal cyclic cosmology, I don't have inflation, but the idea is that the effects of inflation will be produced. So if this is our eon here, then the previous one, you see it's as though this exponential expansion is what looks like inflation to us. And so although there is no additional inflation after the Big Bang, there is this, um, rather like the ideas of Veneziano and company, Gasparini, was it? They had a, a theory where the inflation was, in a sense, before the Big Bang. This is this kind of scheme that I'm following, too, that you don't have after the Big Bang and inflation, but you nevertheless have this exponential expansion, which gives you the scale invariance of the CMB and all that is the idea, and that you don't need inflation. So I, inflation will be a disaster for the scheme, you simply wouldn't be able to get these hawking points, as I call them. The hawking point is the, the little point here on the, pre on the crossover from previous eon to ours, 
and the spot that you see, the Hawking spot, if you like, is the spreading out of that to about four degrees in the sky. Now, you see, here is where quantum gravity would be playing the role. So whatever quantum gravity is, in my view, it's not a standard quantum theory. It would have to involve the reduction of the state. It's part of the theory, and uh, what kind of a theory it is, I have no idea, but it would not be a standard quantum mechanics. And maybe one way of studying that would be to try and study what's involved in these Hawking points, what really it is that's going on there. At least that gives you some observational possibility for exploring whatever gravitational quantum theory or quantum mechanical gravitational theory, whatever you like to say, really is. And that's an exciting thing for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.